So I think it's um, a pretty small group, and we can be pretty informal. I'm not planning to talk uh, for very long, and I. Um, At Catherine's generous invitation, I sort of tailored the idea of talking about health and social justice to talking about a book that I've recently published, which is about health and social justice, but it just makes it easier to frame the whole conversation. Um, so I'm going to take the liberty of referring largely to this book. Um, so uh, the, the context for writing this was that um, I, as Catherine said in the introduction, I work between the fields of law and public health. And there's often difficult or non-existent communication between the two fields. Uh, there are a lot of misunderstandings and a lot of kind of epistemic dissonances in how we consider knowledge and um, progress in the world. Um, but also, I think that there's um, a problem with how we transmit knowledge in that, for example, this book that I was just referring to, there's, there's the literature tends to be um, quite arid and um, insular, directed at a, at a small audience of people who work on the same things and not something that is very accessible to people beyond um, our fields. And in the, in, because not terribly many people work on or care about why health and human rights should go together. That field, the insularity of the field, is a real problem. It's a problem toward getting human rights frameworks into more mainstream public health conversations and programming and funding um, and institutionalization. And it's a problem for having people from other disciplines care about it. Um, so that's why I wrote this book and why I wrote it the way I did, um, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, so it, start, it really starts out with what does it mean to apply a human rights framework to health, which I don't think is self-evident for many people outside of the parameters of the field that I work in. And why should we care? Um, why should the World Bank care or people at the WHO or ministries of health around the world care at all about applying human rights? Um, the book begins, unlike most human rights books, which begin with a recitation of international norms and treaties, um, the book begins with how we understand uh, suffering and um, then goes through a series of um, points that I think uh, build the idea of human rights that I want people to understand, and then talks about, the second part of the book talks about how those can be applied in practice. Um, so, uh, as I said before, the way I uh, wrote the book had very much to do with why I wrote it, because I wanted to reach audiences that might not necessarily pick up this kind of book or be able to understand all of these concepts. So it's a very personal book. Every chapter begins with a story and ends with a story. The first uh, sentence of the introduction is, before I had my two children, I had a miscarriage. Um, and then it goes on to um, put that event into context because and explain that the next week I went on a fact-finding investigation to Chiapas in southern Mexico where at the time there was a lot of paramilitary activity there was a lot of displacement um, and this these are actually some of the communities where I was um, and 
while the week before I had had a miscarriage and I was living in Manhattan and I went into the hospital, I did require surgery, but it was outpatient surgery, I went home. Um, it was not medically a major event. Um, the very next week in one of these IDP camps in the Altos of Chiapas in southern Mexico, I came across a woman who was miscarrying at approximately the same stage of pregnancy. And for her, it was a question of life or death. For her, it was not a question of whether she could go get medical attention to have the hemorrhage stop. The elders, she was in a Zapatista community, so the elders of the community and her husband had decided for her that the medical services offered by the state were part of the counterinsurgency. And it was better for her to die with dignity than to go and seek medical attention to stop her marriage. So I describe in the book how, as a neutral foreign human rights observer, I then have a wave of, well, there, but for the grace of God, go I. And I drop the human rights observer role, and I ensure that she is taken to the hospital accompanied by an NGO representative who the Zapatistas at the time were very concerned that the government would interrogate them and try to get political information out of them. So she was accompanied, she had the surgery she needed, and she was returned to her community with, you know, without being interrogated. Um, but in retrospect, and this is how I start for the grace of God go on, it's because I am a middle class white woman who was living in Manhattan. And I had good health insurance, access to health care, um, uh, control over my own body and decisions, and she didn't. And the way we conceive of our own suffering and the suffering of others is very, very related to how we construe what rights are and how we should think about a right to help and how it's related to dignity. Um, so then in the first chapter, I start out with, I'm not gonna tell all the stories, and this is a disturbing picture, but I start out with a story of, when I began in human rights, I uh, began in Mexico working on very traditional human rights issues, and this was one of the very first torture cases I ever dealt with. And I talk in the book about why, why we think of torture as a quintessential violation of dignity. The complete erasure and annihilation of human agency and human power that torture of another human being entails. You cannot torture somebody who you really invest with fully human capacities. And, um, but then I talk about how there are many, many ways in this world that we annihilate each other's dignity. Some in terms of our personal relationships and some in terms of systemic structures, whether it's labor laws that don't pay wages that people can earn a living wage in, um, whether it's laws that don't treat women as fully human beings. Um, and part of developing a framework of human rights and applying it to health means questioning who gets to be fully human and what are the actions and powers of the state that are implicated. So the second starting point after dignity is we need to rethink human rights. Human rights has greatly evolved from a time where it was just about freedom from torture or due process of law or fair and free elections. But we are still in a place where economic and social rights are radically neglected compared to civil and political rights. And in fact, the whole international human rights enterprise is under enormous critique now in a wave of populism that is sweeping national governments. So the whole positivization of international law that was so 
recursively related to democratization at national level is now really, I think, quite threatened. And part of this is making economic and social rights real rights, making human rights about social justice. So again, I start with a story. I start with a story about, and again, I'm not going to tell the whole story, but it's, it's about um, a military atrocity that occurred, and I was there to investigate. But at the same time, I stayed with some Jesuit nuns who were providing the only health care in the region, and how the understanding of what was a human rights violation committed by the military versus a child who died of diarrheal dehydration because there was no potable water and no access to affordable health care was not understood as a rights violation. And yet the same kinds of erasure of agency, the same kinds of um, uh, impotence over your own life plan and project were in play in both cases. And, and so the chapter elaborates quite a lot on the kind of normative developments and scaffolding that we need to create those obligations. Um, the third starting point is that we also need to rethink public health Public health is very much focused on biological factors uh, or behavioral factors. We are told what to eat, how much to exercise, not to smoke, not to be sedentary, to avoid disease. Um, but thinking about public health in terms of power relationships, in terms of uh, social relationships, which are always power, whether they're gender, whether they're class, whether they're ethnic, and how those power relationships systematically determine the patterns of health and ill health within societies and across societies is still very much, despite the Commission on Social Determinants, very much at the margins of public health thinking. Um, and what, what human rights does in particular, and this, this is a, a story that I tell from India about children who get repeatedly sick because of the uh, water from this um, pond. But, um, you know, so why don't they change their behavior? Why don't they do that when it seems obvious um, that this is what is making their children sick? But it turns out that those children are from a scheduled caste. And for them to be using the well at the middle of the village would have exposed them to enormous violence. And in public health, we so often turn to short-term behavioral interventions, knowledge, attitude, practices, without understanding what the deeper causes of people's ill health is. Um, and what human rights particularly adds to this is identifying responsibility on the part of the state or some institution of the state and holding that, making the person whose health or ill health is effective an active agent in claiming that and the state or some institution of the state or a private actor with a nexus to the state accountable for providing something. Um, so the fourth and last starting point is something I talked about in the class I just taught, which is about health systems. Um, we frequently in public health think of health systems in terms of kind of technical apparatuses to deliver goods and services um, to populations. But if we reconceptualize health systems as social institutions that are as fundamental to society as justice systems or education systems, we think about them differently. We think about how, um, for example, I'll use the United States as an example. Um, there's been an enormous amount of publicity about young men of color feeling excluded or not fully belonging to US society, the Black Lives Matter, because of the way they are treated by the police and the criminal justice system. But if you look at young women of color and children 
they will probably disproportionately say they don't feel fully included in U.S. society because of their interactions with the health system and the radically unequal, unequal health system that we have that creates all kinds of obstacles on the basis of class, um, ethnicity, color, language, immigration status. Um, so thinking about the health system in terms of levels of social solidarity and financing to the way we organize services, primary care versus tertiary hospitals, to the way patients and providers interact at the most micro levels, changes how we, the decisions that we take in health systems. Um, the second part of the book is really how to put these starting points into action, building on examples from different countries around the world. And I talk about governments that have adopted policies that are pro-universal -uni human rights, donors. Uh, I worked um, on a project with Danita in uh, Tanzania in East Africa on funding using some of these principles. Um, litigation, as we talked about in the class just now, in various countries, as well as at the international, supranational level. Social mobilization, movements for <coughs> social accountability in budget monitoring, in um, massive mobilization and protest, um, in political mobilization, and also roles for the UN and the OAS and regional and supranational um, institutions. Um, so I could say more, but why don't I leave it there and we can um, have questions and conversations since time is short. And I'm going to leave this copy with Catherine in case any of you are interested in the book, which is about to come out in paperback, so it'll be a lot cheaper.